to full-time residents that meet the definition of an employee in Eagle County. And we try to keep the wording pretty similar to what Town of Vail and Eagle County uses. Uh, but uh, I know all of you need to check the exact language. Sometimes there's a little word here, uh, different here between those uh, different definitions. A deed restricted agreement between uh, the buyer and the town of Avon restricts the use of the property. In this case, the deed restriction limits ownership and use of the property to employees in Eagle County. In exchange for the deed restriction, town of Avon pays a lump sum through our program. Uh, I, any employee in Eagle County is eligible um, to uh, buy the property. Uh, we define the Eagle County employee as an employee working in Eagle County, average of 32 hours per week for at least eight months a calendar year or, or earn 75% of his or her income by working in Eagle County or a retired individual 60 years or older. That's not going to be me. I'm not going to retire at 60. Retired individual 60 years or older who has worked a minimum of five years in Eagle County for an average of at least 32 hours per week for at least eight months a year or a person who derives income from self-employment whose business is situated in Eagle County, or a person who works for an employer outside of Eagle County if that person can demonstrate such residence as the primary residence for that person. So those last two provisions, particularly the last one, is an effort to accommodate sort of our evolving economy where there's a lot more uh, remote work. And so oftentimes we'll see uh, maybe a consultant or a small business and they may technically have an employer outside of Eagle County, but this is their home and they can demonstrate uh, this has been their home for some time in Eagle County. Hey, Eric. Yes. How long does someone need to work in that capacity, like prior to uh, being qualified? So we, uh, we don't have a set time frame, and I don't think we've run into this, but we we do need to see that someone is established in Eagle County first to be eligible. And we have had applicants under these deed restrictions who have lived outside of the county and they intended to move here and start their business and use this. And that has not qualified uh, under our deed restrictions because they, it's really only eligible to those who are here uh, and already meeting these definitions. Not prospectively going to move here uh, as soon as they buy a place and move in. So they need to be in the position, established in the position and be in Eagle County. Correct. So there's a time frame. Okay, thank you for saying that. Also, Eric, quick question on this, and, and you may be covering it um, next, but how is this verified? So we ask for information in our application, and by and large, uh, we haven't received that many applications that are tricky to interpret. Uh, for the most part, under Mikasa Avon, we're getting applications that are straight up, you know, apple pie uh, employ employees in the county that are um, teachers, uh, you know, working at Vale Health, working at restaurants, chefs at restaurants. And so uh, for the most part, it's been very straightforward. We, we have not received any applications so far that have been um, sort of tricky, unusual situations that get us. Well, in, in, in regards to retired individuals or people working from home, um, because that is tricky. And I think going down, you're going to be having more and more people involved in this. So I just want to be able to advise my buyers as well as possible so that they know what is what they have to be able to, to provide you um, so in the process. I, I think um, for a retired person, so say someone's retiring and they have to show the full five years of uh, 32 hours per week, I, I think the most straightforward would be to show us tax returns that would show that they've been employed and getting their income in Eagle County for the past five years. Uh, I, I, that provision is, I think for the most part is in there so that if someone buys a deed restricted residence and they finish their career here and then they're retired, they don't somehow become inadvertently disqualified from, uh, from uh, that deed restriction. Uh, 
Uh, key provisions, owner of the property must be an employee, property must be located in Avon. And we do get a lot of requests from Eagle Vale. <clears throat> and so there's a, that, that is not within the town of Avon. Uh, uh, but there's certainly we experience that there is a lot of interest in this type of a program in the Eagle Vale area. Property must be used as the owner's primary residence for the first three years. This is something I think that's a little more unique to Avon. And this is from the Avon Council that we we talked about all the different um, needs that could be met. And because our funding wasn't as as much as maybe Vail or Eagle County, we Avon Council decided to focus on helping buyers, owners get into properties. And so the requirement is for the first three years after purchasing the home, uh, the buyer actually has to be living in that home as their primary residence. Three years after acquiring the home, the owner is no longer required to use the property as primary residence. And so they could be rented out to uh, anyone who meets that Eagle County employee definition. Uh, at no time can the property be used as a second home or uh, also at no time can be used for short-term rentals. And the property may only be sold to someone who also meets that definition of Eagle County employee. And then that subsequent buyer, uh, it'll start over again. That subsequent buyer will be required to use the property as their primary residence for at least three years from the date of sale. Uh, individual purchases of property using program must use the home as primary residence. Uh, they do have the ability to rent rooms um, to other Eagle County employees. Uh, and, and that does include um, that we allow for significant others and spouses, whether they're Eagle County employees or not. Uh, after the three-year residency period, the owner is no longer required to use the home as a primary residence um, and may continue to rent it. Uh, is the buyer required to make a minimum down payment? Uh, the town of Avon wants to see at least a minimum contribution of 3% of the buyer's own funds. Uh, that's part of the, we want to see some level of skin in the game. And, uh, and those funds are not to include any third party down payment assistance funds. So we know Eagle County's housing program uh, provides some down payment assistance. That's not, can't be counted towards that 3%. Ownership is limited to the Eagle County employee and uh, Eagle County may take title with a spouse or civil union partner. Uh, can investors participate in the program? No, an owner must use the home as their primary residence for the first three years of ownership. Uh, present owner may not take, uh, owner may not also own another residential property in Eagle County. And so we have had a couple circumstances where uh, someone using this program or buyers using this program have an existing residence and they're selling it uh, wherever that is to buy an Avon. Oftentimes it's uh, moving up from a smaller unit to a larger unit. And so we do track that and verify that the that, um, existing residence is sold. So uh, on, there's in that restrictive, in that deed restriction, there is a agreement that the owner is not going to own another residential property in Eagle County. Does Avon's real estate transfer tax apply? No, we specifically exempt any deed restricted property from housing from uh, Avon's real estate transfer tax. And that is on each sale, uh, initial sale and subsequent sales. How much money is available per purchase? The maximum purchase price for deed restriction right now is 100,000. Uh, there has been some comment from comments from Avon council members that uh, they think we may need to revisit that number. So there's a chance that number may go up to 110 or 120 um, sometime during 2022. The purchase price of the deed restriction will range from 8% to 12% of the purchase price in the purchase contract or appraised value, whichever is lower. Uh, so oftentimes we end up landing at 12%. We have been seeing some recent sales that are, I think the break even is 833,000. And so we have been seeing some recent sales that are for purchases over that 833,000 and will provide up to the maximum $100,000, but then that starts to become a percentage that's a little lower than that 12%. 
Uh, we started the program in August of 2020. We did eight deed restrictions in 2020. Uh, in 2021, we did 13 deed restrictions. Uh, in 2022, we've done four deed restrictions. And we have some, several pending at the moment. Um, so funds remaining. Right now, we have over $1 million. And I think Avon Council is very supportive of the program. And so if we um, were to run low on those funds during 2022, I would imagine we would um, look to supplement those funds and to keep this program going. Uh, my you know, personal observation is I think we, when we started this housing became so tight and inventory was so limited uh, that we're really not seeing the full utilization of this program uh, that could be happening if there was more inventory available um, for purchasers. How does the town evaluate the homes? Uh, we support and maintain permanent year-round resident population and grow a diverse community where there's a wide range of demographics, economics, occupations, and family household sizes are served. Uh, this program is intended to amplify the missing middle, really help uh, those uh, buyers who are fairly settled in the community, uh, that, that, that middle class that is looking for ownership for a, you know, long-term stability. Uh, demonstrate demand exists with the residential housing market for this type of residential product. Uh, fulfills a demonstrated need with a defined segment. Uh, the market value of the deed restriction is comparable to the value of other existing deed restrictions within the community. Uh, is demonstrated by a licensed real estate appraiser. Uh, this most cost-effective and efficient use of town's limited supply of financial resources. So the nice thing about these deed restriction purchase programs is we do not have to get into the complexity of buying land, uh, hiring a designer, architect, engineer, uh, and <coughs> constructing a project to bring housing to market. Fair market value is paid for the deed restrictive relative to current market conditions. Uh, how do applicants receive funds? Uh, we we arrange to have the funds wired to the title company at closing, and that's been fairly straightforward. And for the most part, uh, it has been um, well organized. Uh, every mm -hmm. once in a while, there's uh, glitches with closings, and we're we're kind of scrambling on the day of a closing or the day before to accommodate uh, that closing with making our funds available. I. Uh, can applicants own multiple properties? At the time of purchase of the deed restriction, the owner can, cannot own other residential properties within Eagle County. Uh, there's not a prohibition on owning commercial properties. We don't want uh, someone who's a business owner to um, be prohibited from owning a commercial property. Uh, the owner is still required to utilize property uh, for Mikasa Avon funds as their primary residence for three years following acquisition. We talked about that. Uh, Mikasa Avon deed restriction program is offered on a first come first serve basis uh, and will be queued by complete applications. Uh, the complete application requires a full executed purchase agreement. Um, so we do need to see that the proposed buyer who wants to use these funds actually has an executed purchase agreement. Uh, as soon as you have that, uh, you can email that completed application with that purchase agreement to Mikasa at avon.org. Here's quick, uh, uh, quick steps of our application process. Fire submits the application form along with the executed contract. Uh, we have an internal community uh, committee that reviews these applications. Um, Avon is fairly streamlined. It's a uh, administrative review that is com comprised of myself as the town manager, Scott Wright, who's our finance director, Inika Dijong, who's our general government manager. Uh, we are the three people that review it. If there's any questions, we run them by our uh, town attorney um, for legal advice. Uh, we try to get all of our reviews done within five business days, and then we provide a conditional letter of approval. Uh, the buyer submits paperwork, including evidence of employment, 3% down payment, HOA docs. We typically want to see that there's a home inspection uh, done. Uh, appraisal and other documents that might be uh, relevant to the acquisition. 
uh, we, committee reviews all the documents after final uh, sign off, we send the deed restriction paperwork, uh, the actual forms to be executed to the title company, and then we schedule wiring the funds. On closing day, the town funds are wired, the deed restriction is executed and recorded. Uh, Avon's policy is that our deed restriction needs to be first in line before the deed of trust, uh, and then that gets executed and returned to the town. Uh, the one comment I'll make about that is because of that practice, uh, the, the properties are not eligible for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac funding, uh, which requires deed restrictions to be subordinated. Um, that's an issue that we're studying at the moment to uh, understand that consequence. Um, for the investment by the town of Avon, uh, we really prefer to not have any risk that these deed restrictions might somehow be extinguished in the uh, future through a foreclosure. So uh, that, that's the policy right now, but that is something that we're uh, studying to understand what that impact is on available mortgage financing. Uh, how can you help promote the program? Uh, mention the program and eligible listings in Avon, promote the benefits of Mikasa Avon to sellers. Um, the threat is waived besides providing the, the funds and posting about happy, happy clients that close under the program. Uh, I have to say, we have received so many heartfelt thank yous and um, people literally in tears um, with this, um, getting funding for this, that there's um, such an appreciation um, by folks that, that live here and want to settle to actually be able to buy a uh, place in Avon. And there's a couple happy, happy uh, home buyers that we were glad to help. Any questions about the Mikasa Avon program? Eric, do you have specific lenders then that you guys recommend because of you wanting to be in first place? I, I I can't say I would recommend my, and I really haven't been tracking it that closely, but I believe First Bank and Alpine Bank both have been providing uh, mortgage loans for with these Mikasa Avon deed restrictions. And I think uh, Vail, Vail and um, Eagle County probably also have uh, references, but mostly I think it's, it's banks that are located, local banks that are located in Eagle County have been able to accommodate these programs. Yeah. Is there an appreciation gap or cap on selling it after three years? Uh, there is no appreciation cap. And so the thinking is, is that with, as we expand this inventory of deed restricted properties, we'll start to have a secondary residential market where local full-time residents compete only with local full-time residents and not with second homeowners. Eric, I got confused a little bit on one of your slides. It said that at the time of purchase, the buyer cannot own any other property uh, in Eagle County, but after they purchase this, uh, you mentioned commercial, but can they also buy an investment property if they want it after they own this or not? Yes. No, I've, uh, they're, they're restricted from only owning one residential property. Anyway. During the ownership of this property, they cannot own any other residential property. That's what you're saying. Correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think these slides um, yeah. contradict each other. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, clean that up before I send that over to um, send that over to Vail Valley Real Estate. <clears throat> Can they own another property within Colorado, just not inside of Eagle County? Correct. That's correct, Monique. And can an owner place the deed restriction on their property years after they bought it? For instance, buying it now and putting it on a year from now? <laughs> no, we don't. We don't offer that right now. I think there's a little different approach with the town of Vail, but because of the uh, limitation on the funds, the focus is really to help new buyers um, be able to uh, get into homes. Okay. So, hey, Eric, thank you. Great presentation. Um, question: What happens if they have a change of an employment? Um, while they own the property, change of employment where they don't meet the Eagle County. Uh, 
Well, that's just that's something we would have to review. If they become ineligible, then uh, we have mechanisms in the deed restriction language uh, that form that would require them to sell that property ultimately if they don't meet that. Okay. If there's not any more questions, as I promised, I got a little bit more bonus information for Avon that I can show. I'll give one last chance if there's any more questions about Mikasa Avon, or you can just, if they come to mind, just let me know. Okay. Uh, so Avon is a member of Colorado Association of Ski Towns, CAST. And uh, we, there was a housing task force formed last August, 2021. Um, for those not familiar with CAST, it's uh, all of the ski uh, resort towns, Breckenridge, Telluride, Aspen, Vail, uh, along with a number of uh, nearby towns uh, like Frisco or Silverthorne, um, and uh, as well as some of the ski resorts outside of Colorado, uh, including Park City. Uh, so it's a fairly good group that shares a lot of ideas and there's no doubt that there is a, a huge amount of commonality in the challenges that we face. And so uh, at a meeting last August, uh, we recognized housing was a pressing issue and formed a housing task force. Uh, very quickly, we focused on, um, thought that whatever we can do to help bring more money to um, housing development would be the most effective uh, approach. And so we focused on uh, legislation for the upcoming, for this 2022 legislative session. We adopted a legislative policy statement uh, that included four areas uh, where we support legislation. One is a lodging tax, authorizing um, counties that have a lodging tax to use that lodging tax revenue for workforce housing. And I'll mention, there is a bill pending about that. I will mention that in the next in an upcoming slide. Uh, short-term rental tax. And so uh, some home rule municipalities have adopted a short-term rental tax, and that is like a lodging tax, but it does not apply to any lodging properties that are assessed as commercial. And so by example, in Avon, uh, we did pass a short-term rental tax. It does not apply to Comfort Inn and our one bed and breakfast because those properties are assessed as commercial. Um, but applies to all the other lodging in town because of timeshares and condo hotels and then and condos um, are all assessed as residential. And so we felt that that's a good uh, potential source of revenue. And those communities that have adopted short-term rental taxes have seen very strong majority voter support to uh, adopt those taxes. Right now, um, Crested Butte, Town of Telluride, Town of Avon all have a short-term rental tax and uh, the Town of Ure uh, adopted a 15% short-term rental tax uh, last uh, November. And I understand that Town of Frisco is considering a short-term rental tax this spring. Um, so we think that that's something that makes sense to uh, be authorized beyond just home real municipalities. Uh, third position is that we're seeking to increase AMI thresholds for state and federal funding. Uh, and we put in as a goal, this uh, is probably overly ambitious, but put in a goal of 150% for rentals and 200% for ownership. And so one of the challenges is there is available state and federal funding, um, but the AMI thresholds are so low that it, it really limits the effectiveness of those types of programs in our uh, resort areas like Eagle County. And then the last one is uh, position is to uh, advocate for amending Tabor Taxpayers' Bill of Rights to authorize a real estate transfer tax uh, for workforce housing, not for other purposes, but just for workforce housing. Uh, that uh, we had no interest in this legislative session, and I think that's for the obvious reasons that we're going into an election cycle this year. And um, so I'd be curious to see if there's what kind of interest there might be in next year's legislative session. House Bill 22-1117 is a pending bill right now. This afternoon, it is front of the Senate Finance Committee. It has passed uh, the, the House and the Colorado Legislature. It would authorize counties and local marketing districts to use a lodging tax for workforce housing and childcare. Uh, there is a requirement for a new vote if there's existing lodging tax to authorize that use of revenues for, um, for workforce housing or childcare. 
Uh, and then there's a, a, I've got an incomplete bullet point here. There's a draft bill for short-term rental host site compliance. Um, this is, uh, I think, being um, considered by Colorado Counties Incorporated. Uh, that's the group that represents all the counties in the state. And those would be mandates that would require providing um, a list of minimum information for short-term rental, um, short-term rentals that have a host site uh, like Airbnb or VRBO. The intent of that is to start getting information together so that the impacts of short-term rental are not uh, as anecdotal as um, what the discussions have been uh, so far. Um, and then uh, lastly, there has been discussion of a bill to assess short-term rental properties as commercial. Uh, I don't see that coming out this year, maybe next year. Uh, the, the, right now, I think the struggle is it, it, it appears very complicated to administer for county assessors um, because properties could potentially switch back and forth between assessed as residential versus commercial. And uh, some of our recognition in this housing task force is that the short-term rental tax is a lot easier to uh, implement and impose. What is the short-term rental amount tax in uh, Avon? The short-term rental tax in Avon is 2%, and that is in addition to our 4% lodging tax and our 4% sales tax. Uh, our 2% short-term rental tax is estimated to generate about a million dollars per year, and it will it is um, by the ballot language, it is limited to be used for all that revenue is limited to be used for community housing. Thank you. Um, so some other housing actions we're taking in Avon besides Mikasa Avon program, uh, we're actively working on a Swift Gulch employee housing program for the town of Avon. Uh, Avon, just like any other employer, we are struggling um, to uh, fill all of our vacancies. Uh, we're particularly seeing challenges um, in transit and transit drivers. And so the, um, the effort is to uh, build apartment units. Swift Gulch is the just uphill behind where our regional bus barn is. Um, so that would actually be on, on town land and uh, adjacent to that town facility. And uh, right now we got through a conceptual planning phase. We think we can do 45 apartment units up there and hoping to uh, and get through a design phase by early summer and get that bid out and maybe start construction in spring of 2023. Uh, we're trying to partner with a development on track Y, which is on Metcalf Road, and that would potentially have 52 to 54 duplex and townhome units. And we're uh, in concept uh, looking to apply funds in a manner similar to the Mikasa Avon, where there would be a deed restriction without a price cap. Uh, we're also looking at land acquisition at the village of Avon for housing, uh, potentially looking at 5.25 acres that would be on the north side of the highway on the far east side of the village at Avon and could potentially be 200 residential units. And then in that same area, the town owns uh, what is called the East Avon Preserve uh, that was acquired by through the Forest Service uh, years ago under a multi party land exchange. And there's six area, six acres planned for potential community housing, and that has a potential for another 200 residential units. So those are our near-term focus on housing projects in Avon. I have one express interest if they're interested in something like that. Pardon? How does a buyer express interest if they are interested in any one of those projects? I think as soon as they get to the point that there's, a, it, we know something is going to get built that they can buy and move into, uh, I, I'm sure there would be a lot of publicity about that. And if um, if appropriate, then we'd probably be taking uh, interest or you know depending on demand for especially for the public projects, maybe looking at some kind of lottery system. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and we haven't figured out the details yet um, of those projects. Uh, they may be um, condominiums or townhomes for ownership and uh, other projects may be more focused on low or middle income rental projects. Okay, so there's this, uh, I got the system for this still. Um, excuse me, uh, pardon me? 
They're still coming up for a system for buyers to express interest still. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think when those projects get a little further along and we know that they're um, likely to occur, um, that's probably the time we'll be looking at the, the right way for us to receive that potential buyer interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, also related to housing actions, um, council, Avon Council wants to look at short-term rental regulations. Uh, so we'll be looking at that in March or April. For those of you familiar with Avon, uh, you probably all know Wild Ridge does not allow short-term rentals. And we currently allow short-term rentals just about everywhere on the Valley floor. And so uh, we're gonna be looking at some options of potentially adjust that a little uh, due to some of the concerns about short-term rentals um, taking away rental housing from full-time residents. Uh, council would like to look at, uh, was there a question? Uh, council wants to look at an amendment to our real estate transfer tax exemptions to increase our exemptions for primary residents from 240 to probably something like 400,000. And I suspect that'll probably come to council late winter or spring in the next month or two. And then lastly, we're actively talking about regional housing discussions and exploring partnerships and, um, and working on uh, getting a countywide inventory of potential properties for housing development uh, and doing that planning work this spring so that we have a little bit better of a bigger picture uh, of what might be possible in Eagle County for housing development. And that's all I had. So if you need to get a hold of me, best way is by email at eric, E-R-I-C, at avon.org. And be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Hey, Eric, this is Mel. I have two in chat. If I, and you may have answered these, but I just want to make sure they don't get missed. Um, one is, is there a map of the housing actions, um, the housing actions that you referred to? Is there a map? No, there's not a map currently, but uh, that is part of, as we've been working with other jurisdictions, I think that's is probably something that'll come up in the spring so that we can better communicate to the public what everyone's doing and because right now it's probably each jurisdiction is doing their own things and it probably seems a little haphazard. Sure. Uh, and the other one uh, is uh, can property be owned outside of Eagle County and also asking if commercial property can be owned within Eagle County. Commercial property is under the Avon, Mikasa Avon deed restriction. Commercial property can be owned in Eagle, in Eagle County and any other property can be owned outside of Eagle County. I'm Kim Bell Williams. I'm the executive director of the Eagle County Housing and Development Authority. I've been a realtor since 2004. That makes me old, I think. It's a really long time. I'm really happy to be here to chat with you guys um, and talk about affordable housing. Patty Learman, also realtor for putting on the spot, 2009. Okay, so that was a while ago. Um, and we both work for Eagle County on the government level. So excited to share with you some of the new efforts that we're doing um, on the county level around housing. And so with that, I'm just gonna jump into sharing some information. Oh, there we go. Hold on, sorry, gotta get the hang of this keyboard. So really what um, the Housing Authority does for the county as a whole, many of, some of you may know, some of you may not, but we do um, housing needs assessments. So that's kind of the job of every Housing Authority is to look at what their community needs are. And the last housing needs assessment we did was in 2018. And that housing needs assessment showed that, guess what? No surprise, we need a lot of units. 4,000 units, and by 2025, we're looking at a total of 6,000 units. So that is a number we all feel, but just having that in black and white. Um, inside those numbers, and you can feel free to print this report and get it, grab it, email me, Patty will send it to you. I don't wanna go into too much detail. I think we all know this, but we know a couple of things intrinsically. We know that, and through the report, through the study, that 
about half of those units or 2,400 units would require some kind of subsidy below market. That was in 2018. <laughs> so now I think that number is much, much higher. Um, we also know that back in 2018, the rental cost went up substantially from 2000, our last study in 2007. So the cost of renting was super high. And then finally, in the housing world, we talk about the, I'm trying to stand still and not move <laughs> for the camera. Hopefully it's okay for you guys on, on the screen. Um, but the housing affordability gap is kind of where we feel a lot of the pressure here as local buyers. So I'm gonna explain that to you really quick. So basically that means if I'm making, and I'm gonna try not to use housing speak, but if I'm making the area median income for a family of four, that number comes from HUD and that number is $100,000. So if I'm making $100,000 and only 30% of that goes to the cost of my housing, then a purchase price that I can afford is about $435,000. You guys see the emails that come through, you study the data, you know what our area median home sales price is. And so if we're at one point, let's just use a million dollars to have an even number and you can afford a house of $400,000. I have an affordability gap of $600,000. I just went for easy math there, but you guys are all shaking your head yes in the audience. I can't see what you guys are doing on the screen. Um, and so that aff affordability gap has always really been present in Eagle County. I would say probably since 1964, it's probably been around. We all manage it differently. I can talk about my personal story. I bought a house. We had about nine years of renters until we started creating non-paying renters, which are otherwise known as children. <laughs> and um, that's how we kind of made it work where we were paying a lot more than our 30% of our income. And so I think you guys probably have similar stories too, but if I had to repeat my story today versus in 2002, I could not do it. Okay, so that's why I want people to kind of internalize this a little bit and think about how you could make your story work today. And so that's what we're seeing in the marketplace. Then we turned around and participated in another study that happened um, a year ago, we were working on this in 2021 called the Mountain Migration Study. And so inside that study, we were really looking at what are some of the effects of COVID on um, the the real estate marketplace, but also on employment. And there were a variety of other factors that we looked at. Also a great study, happy to share that with you. It looked at the mountain region area. So it just wasn't Eagle County. It was a, a broader look really. And I will be perfectly honest. I do not feel like, here, let me get you guys to a place where you can see all the words there. I do not feel like Eagle County is having our own unique challenges anymore. I think it's Eagle County, Summit County, Yampa, Pitkin, Garfield, I mean, it's it's chafy. It's basically draw a circle in the mountain and we're all having similar challenges, period. And that wasn't true 10 or even 20 years ago. We all kind of like grew into this similar challenge. And so what the mountain migration study showed is that um, for sale inventory is hit at historic lows. You guys all know that. And that rental inventory is largely non-existent or really hard to come by. Um, we have this new term called location neutral worker, telecommuter, there's a lot of other terms for this, but someone who can work remotely. And I think COVID, well, I know for a fact, also for us, we learned how to work from home, even though we had an office in Eagle County. So a lot of people that learned to work remotely could live anywhere and that pushed a lot of people to moving into um, Eagle County because it's a great place to live. I'm just curious, with your hands or your words, whatever, how many people do you know in your neighborhood that are location neutral that moved to Eagle County during COVID? <coughs> yeah, you guys have some? Yeah. Okay. Plenty. Yeah, so more than half of the people in the room raised their hand and you guys on the screen, sorry, I'm not trying to ignore you. You guys probably had some too. Um, and so that kind of pressure on a marketplace anywhere really creates prices, the prices to move up. Low inventory, lots of people want to be here who are making more money. That was the other thing the survey showed is that the report from Mountain Migration is that folks who are moving here who are location neutral 
are not making that $100,000 for family of four. They're more like $300,000 in their annual incomes. They can afford more and they're coming to the table with cash. And so seeing all of this kind of happen, we really had to, um, had to think outside the box. And there is no one silver bullet for how housing is gonna be fixed. And so we've always had a multi-pronged approach um, with the Housing Authority and the Valley Home Store and Eagle County Housing Department. Um, but really we wanted to come to the table to see what we could do today. Um, there's a good example, and I, I love the state, but the um, DOLA housing, I don't even know their formal name, they're the, the, the housing department at the state, um, received some money in 2019 that it was their job to get out to partners across the state. It took them 18 months to deploy those programs and get that money out. So our goal was to come up with some programs that we could start as quick as possible, that we could get some money into the community and help support housing on all different levels. So we came up with something called the Gold Housing Moves, and we um, proposed a handful of programs, and that's what we wanna go through with you guys today is some of the programs that we have available and some that are coming um, that we're still working on. But on July the 27th, the Board of County Commissioners uh, basically signed us a $10 million check um, to support the work of this program. That money came out of their <coughs> reserve fund. So they had more than enough reserve and they decided to put some money behind these programs. And so I'm gonna do the first program. Um, and actually I'm gonna make this a little smaller so you can see the whole screen. Is that okay? Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, if you're a realtor and you don't know about down payment assistance, come over here so I can slap you. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, this program has been around since the mid 90s and really just had a dedicated group of realtors and lenders that put this together. Chris, how long have you been on that committee? Were you involved in that way back? In 2000. Okay, yeah. Chris has been serving on our home buyer assistance committee. Um, for that's two decades now. Kevin, Kevin Armitage <laughs> is a year longer than me. Okay. Well, both of you have been super it's dedicated. Yeah. <laughs> but figuring out how to get locals into homes. And hopefully, I'm, I'm also curious how many people have had buyers that use this program or used it themselves. Okay. A lot of people are proud of you guys. Good job. So this program has changed over the years based on um, market demand and um, lots of other factors, but this is where we're landing today. So the bold housing moves idea was to increase the contribution up to 5% of the purchase price. We also increased up to a maximum purchase price of $750,000. And guess what? In August, that felt like an okay place. Right now, today, this feels like it might be too low. So that's part of us being responsive to the market. That may change, and that's um, something we take back to the Home Buyer Assistance Committee. They say yes, they say yes or no, and then we change those um, those guidelines. So it does require the buyer to put a a one percent of the purchase price towards the purchase. We do have debt to income ratio of forty five percent or less, and a lot of the similar rules you heard from the MiCasa program has to be your primary residence. Um, you can't own any other real estate. You have to work and live in Eagle County. We also require um, the home buyer class that we offer for free through the Valley Home Store. Mm -hmm. And then this can be um, paired with our other programs that we're gonna go into. <laughs> so some of these programs you can stack and get quite a bit of money. And so I'm really glad you're here today so we can walk you through that. Megan's our program lead and that's her contact information there. And did you guys have any other questions? I feel like so Kim, if they were to buy like an Eagle Ranch <coughs> that's already deed restricted, they can still use this. Great for, question. Yeah. Yes, it's for any properties in Eagle County. Yeah. If they're buying a house in Leadville, it does not qualify. Yeah. But yes, it can be deed restricted or open market as long as it um, fits in the program guidelines. Also, if you have a buyer using this and there's something that comes up, please reach out to us. We want that communication. Like if there's a problem like, oh, you know, like I mentioned the maximum purchase price of 750, I, I know that's low, but in August that was good, right? So, um, but if there's something else that we need to think about, that's where we have the Home Buyer Assistance Committee and we go to them and say, look, 
what do you think about this? And they say yes or no. And actually lenders are the best at bringing those, those questions to us. We get them quite a bit on different situations or scenarios we haven't thought of. So what happens is this money gets, um, gets contributed at the closing table and it gets put under a second deed of trust, but the actual homeowner does not make payments. And so it's a shared appreciation model. So over time, you know, if you it's if it's five percent of the purchase price, it's five percent of the sales price that gets paid back. So that's why this program has been so successful because it's a revolving fund and it's a fifteen-year term. So the money goes out, it helps someone get into a house, they build equity, they sell it, they move on, they refinance. The money comes back usually in a bigger amount into the pool, and then it goes back out. I also want to mention that um, the Vail Board of Realtors has been amazingly supportive of this program. They recently gave a $75,000 donation. Um, Betsy over there, well done. She like put her foot in that door and like kept kicking it for us um, just this year. So supporting that, that $75,000 will go into this fund and will live there forever and keep growing and keep supporting local home ownership. So it's been awesome to have the support of the people who are doing the business that recognize that this program is really valuable. Can I ask one question? Yeah. How does it work combined with say the Avon for uh, Mikasa program? Can you do both then? Yes, you can. You want to answer that? So um, this loan will sit behind all of the other ones. Okay. Okay, so it's going to sit behind the mortgage, it's going to sit behind the deed restriction. Um, and it's going to, We'll come to the closing table. The, the buyer is filling out a loan application for their primary loan and for this as the subordinate loan. Um, everything is brought to the table at closing. And um, again, there's no payment by the buyer. Um, if they refinance, the, the term could come due. Um, generally, what happens is the buyer pays it back upon closing when they go to sell it. Um, other things that could happen is it reaches is the 15 year long term and they have to pay it back. Um, if someone were to do a refinance where it's a cash out refinance and they want to remodel a kitchen or something, it would come due. Um, but other, and if they pay it off within two years of the interest rate. It's a pretty easy loan. Most people forget they have it. Yeah. And when there's equity in the home, it gets mm -hmm. paid off at closing. If there's no equity in the home, you just pay back the money for yeah. Good questions. Anything mm -hmm. else? And I'm looking online because I, I, do you guys have any questions on remote? Okay, all right. So we're gonna move on to our next program and Patty, it gets turned over to you and I'll, how about if I drive while you talk? Sure. Okay. All right, thank you all for coming. It's good to see you in the room. Um, hi to everybody online. So we wanna talk a bit about the Good Deeds program. Has everybody in the room heard about this? Yeah, a lot of people have. Okay, cool. So this is similar to Vail and D. This is similar to Mikasa Ava. We structured this program a little differently to provide buyers with a couple different options. Um, the base uh, criteria for this is that you have a maximum purchase price of $850,000. The buyer um, investment is 3%. So we ask that every buyer is going to bring that minimum contribution of 3% to closing. This is the primary residence only. We will not allow any other real estate to be owned anywhere. So this is not just outside Eagle County. This is not inside Eagle County. This is anywhere. Um, you must work in Eagle County on average 30 hours a week or more year round. There is an annual recertification that will be required. Um, so if you have um, friends or family who own in Miller Ranch, they are familiar with that process. It's not, it's not that painful. There are restrictions on resale. So in this case, um, we, will, we need to qualify whoever the buyer is, and I'll go over those restrictions on resale in a moment. Um, this program is compatible with down payment assistance, and then I will discuss cash buying a little bit. The two different options for deed restrictions are as follows. So we wanted to provide two different cash options. So if, if the buyer says, well, I want a little bit, Maybe they are selling an existing property and they have a little bit of equity, but the housing market has gone up so much that they're like, oh, this is really hard to get into the next price point. This 5% cash contribution might be a good option because what that's gonna do is it's gonna give them a resident occupied deed restriction. So if we think about what the Vail and D deed restriction is, if we think about what the Casa Avon deed restriction is, 
That's just saying this has to be a primary residence. There is no cap on the appreciation for this. Um, and so our contribution again is 5% at closing. We have seen people using this when they are selling a home and they already have some equity that they're bringing in from the sale of their other home. The 15% cash contribution will buy a price capped deed restriction. So if everyone's familiar with Miller Ranch and the other price capped deed restrictions, that's what this is gonna get you. We have found that the, um, the majority of people using this so far are the first time home buyers who just can't get that down payment. And um, they're able to get a much higher contribution towards their uh, closing. These are both compatible with down payment assistance. And we are seeing a variety of combinations happening here. As Eric mentioned earlier, we have run into some issues with lenders, with lending and lenders. So, um, Fannie Mae does not like some of these uh, good deeds, Mikasa Veiling Deed programs. So, um, but Freddie Mac is saying yes to this. However, Freddie Mac will not do it if it's combined with down payment assistance. So, if you have a buyer who's really set on getting a 30 year fixed mortgage, they can do either one of these good deeds, deed restrictions, as long as they're not combining it with down payment assistance. If they need to do combine with down payment assistance, we're kind of sending everybody in the direction of First Bank or Alp, I think. Um, that does mean they're getting a portfolio loan, but if that means we're getting them into a home, we're also getting a deep restricted property in the future for all future buyers, that's really important. And they can always look at refinancing in the future. Um, one thing that's really important to note too is we want you to be discussing all of this with your buyers in advance, but we want them they are required to have an application. To get the application, they have to have a 30 minute meeting with me. So we don't just have the application sitting out there that they can fill out any time. We really wanna spend time going over all of the program guidelines, what it means to have a, a deed restriction on a home, what it means to have this exchange of cash. Um, and depending on which option they choose, we want them to have a good understanding of what that means in the future for resale. So for the resident occupied 5% option, you all are their brokers. So this, this is a market rate home. That's not territory we're going to jump into. We want you all to be able to coach your buyers on what is market rate, how to market the home at, um, accurately. Then we will qualify the buyer once they're under contract. For the 15% price cap deed restriction, this is going to work very similar to Miller Ranch. Um, there's a lot of stewardship and preservation that happens throughout the life of this deed restriction. So we are communicating a lot with these owners. We work through all of their capital improvements so they can add value back into their homes. Uh, we're doing annual recertifications with them. There's a lot of communication that we have with them. And then what we do is we end up running a lottery upon resale. So that will come through us as um, the real estate broker. So part of that meeting that we have ahead of time that's 30 minutes is me going over every line of deed restriction, talking about what this means, and then I give them access to the application and can fill it out. For the most part, people don't have a property identified, so I can give them a letter of intent and you all can help them go shop for a home. Once that home is identified, then we regroup, we need copies of the contract, title commitment, all that good stuff, and then we're communicating throughout the process to make sure that we have all of the things we need for closing, including wire instructions, everything gets processed through the county finance department, which by the way, since it's a government entity, we need more than two days notice for a change in your closing date. So, <laughs> <laughs> communicate with us along the way, CC us along the way, <laughs> um, because we do have, you know, our process with our finance department is like, hey, we need this on one day of the week, one day of the week, one day of the week, so we want to be planning in advance. Um, but so far, we've We've had a lot of very smooth closings, but it's been great. So we've had some pre-construction, new construction homes. We've gotten a property in Eagle Vale, and I'm gonna give a shout out to Eric Heil in the town of Avon. If you have more people interested in Eagle Vale where Mikasa doesn't work, please send them our way. And I don't think he's on the call. <laughs> we would anymore. love more Eagle Vale properties. We would love some Avon and I mean, Edwards properties. Um, does anybody have questions about good Chris, yeah, real quick, could you address a little bit more deeply the whole fire works in Eagle County? Because yes. where I get a lot of pushback is, are these people that are working from home? 
And, you know, they feel that even though their employer is not here, they need all the other guidelines. Right. Can you address that? So our housing guidelines are structured differently than the town of Avon's guidelines, which are structured differently than the town of Vale's guidelines, which are different than the town of Eagle's, <laughs> which are also different than Eagle Ranch. So we're sorry about that. We're trying to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so to make it all the more confusing, every time that we get a question like this, we'll say, well, it depends. Let's take a look at the deed restriction we're looking at. So in the case of good deeds, which falls under the umbrella of Eagle County, um, what we are looking at is um, we want to see a pay stub that references a business located here in Eagle County. Let's say this person works for the Marriott. That pay stub is going to say that they work in Georgia, but we know that they actually work at the Marriott here in Eagle. Mm -hmm. um, where it does get a bit gray is, again, when we talk about telecommuters, but our Eagle County guidelines currently state that telecommuters do count as long as they've had residency established in Eagle County for a year or more. Oh, that I think we took right? up the year, but we just said residency in Eagle County. Okay. Right. So, so their kids are registered for school, they're voters, uh -huh. they vote here, they, they like good. They're contributing so, members. Yeah. That's so a good one. We we are always looking <clears throat> at that in that document. The housing guidelines is a document that is updated <coughs> annually. So at any point we might take a look at what the need is and make revisions to that. And yeah. The, the guidelines we don't really touch like once every 10 years, but the administrative procedures we update every year because HUD gives us new numbers. So we have to really stay agile with the administrative procedures. But you're probably not going to dig into that unless you're a homeowner because that's the homeowners want to read the housing guidelines and administrative procedures to figure out how to sell their house with a price cap. Right. What's the price cap? Is it 3% or it's is it going to be floating? Right. It's, it, it is floating at 0 to 3% simple interest. And it's going to be based on equal county wages. No, the, the price. So the price of uh, uh, the appreciation on yes. the home. Okay. So that's so what you oh, what you buy it for less the purchase. Yeah. The deed restriction purchase. Yeah. And that's where you'll start appreciating, and then you go from there up. So let's say you buy an eight hundred fifty thousand dollar house, and you get a hundred thousand dollar deed restriction purchase. You're yeah. appreciating from seven fifty. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Good question. Yeah. And I know you just said this, I just wasn't clear. So the telecommuters, they do have to be here for one year before they're eligible, or did you say they have to claim Eagle County as their residency, period. Yeah. So we're gonna ask for proof of residency. And what is that? I mean, yeah. in my mind, it's voter registration, the kids are going to school here, yeah. like they're you know, they're yeah. engaged in the community and whatever level that means, but yeah. As soon as I say what it is, that someone will have something different and creative yeah. and new, and I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. That's on the list too. So, so yeah, it's up to them to prove residency. Um, okay, so one year would be ideal, but if they can prove all those other things, it's not like a hard and fast rule. But... Yeah, but to Patty's point, that if we find that all of our Miller Ranch houses are going to folks who work for Google. Yeah. I don't want to pick on Google, but seriously, yeah. maybe I should get a job there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, then then the guidelines are subject to change that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to touch on that, so you guys don't get freaked out that the telecommuters are going to come in and snatch up all the other range. Um, the the lottery process is outlined in those same housing guidelines administrative procedures. And in there it does say if you fall below a certain income threshold, which most of our residents do, um, they get additional points on their application. Also, that application um, awards people points for their history of residency, their history of working in Eagle County. So someone who is trying to get in as a telecommuter and is just moving here is probably not competitive in comparison to that person who's been working at Matsuhisu for the last 15 years. So if that restaurant didn't go on at all. So, um, so if you, you get what I'm saying, like someone who's been working at a restaurant has been yeah, in this yeah. valley for a really long time. And the Eagle County's housing guidelines admin procedures breaks all that out about how we score lotteries, how we do that. And so for these price cap units, we're following the same process. Just, yeah. And last question on mm -hmm. this, maybe, maybe last question. Um, <laughs> uh, the maximum purchase price of 850, is that applied both to the 5% and the 15? Yes. Okay. 
And again, this as we're seeing things change, that's something we're probably going to be looking at again really soon. So, um, but no guarantee. Again, this is never anything that's a quick process or overnight, but if you have someone looking, just have them reach out to Patty because I think, you know, I know we're about to enter the busy locals sales season and um, we have the flexibility to change those guidelines as we see requests coming in. So far, everyone coming in has been at 850 or below. Um, but if we start hearing from you all that your, your local buyers are not able to get in or they're not able to use this program because the prices have exceeded 850 and they're, we want to be able to keep that so that we can make those adjustments if we need to. Patty, I don't know if you'll know this, but what's the highest price sale in the range? Do you know? 564, right? Yeah, yes. we just had one. But, you know, they're appreciating. And no, I know that's kind of it. I mean, it's been around since 2004, yeah. five. Yeah. I can see so, a future where Miller Ranch may need a subsidy yeah. to get back to being more affordable. But for now, that person who was buying that unit was selling something they had a lot of equity in. So they were stepping into that. 560 with, with quite a bit of equity. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so was that, what, what kind of was that? Was that a single family with a car? It was, was a single family. So it's garage. the biggest property. <coughs> basement, two car garage. Right. Yeah. Okay. Probably, finished basement. probably have remodeled. Did you do the loan on that one? Uh, um, okay. You're, you're shaking your head like, yeah, I know. No, that I was, was just like, that's a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it sounds affordable, yeah. isn't it? It's, We're all uh, like, but how many offers did you have on that I can't remember. Which less one. than six. I mean, many times Patty will get, you know, between 20 and 30 offers. Mm -hmm. um, but that one was fewer offers, but it was people who had some, you know, it wasn't a first time home buyer at that price point. Yeah. So when it's under 500, we're seeing. 18 to 20 offers, mm -hmm. um, you know, but the, it just changes dramatically who's offering when it's a two bedroom condo versus a three bedroom townhome. And then once you get into single families, right. um, where the price point, the townhomes and the single family homes just have such a different price point and a different need from yeah. buyers um, that, but those two bedroom entry level units that are between 250 and 300, there's a big list for those too. Uh, uh, how often are they coming up? Less and less and less. Yeah, because uh, I have a friend waiting and waiting. Yeah. Right, I know. So in the last few years, so I started in early, in January 2018. And for those first few years, it was around 24 Miller Ranch units that transacted in the neighborhood each year. And last year we had seven. Oh, that's big. It hurts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's also why we have the Good Deeds program and we're looking at expanding the inventory. And so with that, Patty, you better jump in. I know, I know. we're trying to make that. I don't mind. Like, so 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 yeah. The it's whole thing you want to know. Yeah. We, are, we are really dying to get <laughs> that sort of middle buyer from Miller Ranch out. We know that a lot of them have outgrown their homes. We know that a lot of other buyers around here are like bursting in the seams inside of a Sunridge unit and they're like, get me out of here. So. As, a, as another alternative to Good Deeds, this one is going to be paired together with Good Deeds. We also have Cash Buy. This one is so close to being able to roll out. And this is the one that we want to partner with all of you to do. Um, that we want to be able to sit in front of your buyer so that they can offer cash on a home so that they're competitive with some of these other folks who are coming in with cash. I know that this doesn't always solve the whole $100,000 of our offer. Um, but hopefully this helps make them no longer contingent on the sale of their other home and it makes them a little more competitive right so what Eagle County wants to be able to do is say we're going to we're going to buy it cash we're going to sit in front of this buyer and we're going to close within this like two week time period right now we're going to be holding on to that house and that buyer can take their time getting their loan from a local lender we are going to say that if you're going to use this we're putting a deed restriction on it so they will get their choice of either the 5% or the 15% um, deed restriction buyer's choice. Um, this is gonna be a lot of kind of coaching up front. So again, that potential buyer is gonna be meeting with me to understand what putting a deed restriction on a home means and what it means down, down the road. But um, you know, this one also carries the most logistics, trickiness. I don't know what other word you wanna put on this, but 
This one's not an easy one to implement because there is so much to this. We want to make sure that we have some type of a of guidance for you to be able to make an offer on a home at Friday night at 11 p.m. or Saturday night at 7 p.m. because you know we're government and we're there nine to five Monday to Friday. But we want to be able to give you instructions on how to make this work so that you are either writing it as an assignable contract and we're sitting right behind you, and then we're going to jump in on Monday morning to help you make this happen. Um, and you know what contingencies we need to have in there. So we do want the inspection done. We do want to make sure that there's an appraisal done. Um, here my, so there's a few other things we want to make or make sure that are done and then we can turn around. So if that inspection is done in those first 10 days, now it makes it a lot easier for us to turn around so that it's only a loan, a loan termination deadline when we're selling it back to the buyer. So we do want the buyer to be purchasing their own inspection. So it's not us doing the inspection, it is the buyer because we're kind of doing everything on their behalf in front, but it is the buyer getting the inspection during the time that we're under contract for cash. So I'm sure you guys can come up with all sorts of ideas on how this could get really complicated. Um, <laughs> but we also want to hear about how you think we can make this work really well. Do you know there's other business models, other lenders out there, companies that are doing this? That's where I got the idea. So <laughs> we charge a lot of money to do it. And we are not here to make a profit off of our locals. So when I saw how much they were charging, it was like 10%. Mm -hmm. And then there was also like tacked on fees for however long they were holding the home for. We were like, that's bananas, that's a lot of money. We're not a venture capital company. So, you know, there is going to be probably a small fee because we do have to put property insurance on the home. Um, there's title commitments. There's, mm -hmm. there's a few other things that we have to put in here. So there will be a small charge to the buyer, but I think that this is going to be well worth it for them to get home. So what's the max? That's great. That's a good question. So this is the coming soon program. So we're working on some of the details right now. Um, and then our next step is to get it through our attorney's office and then put it in front of the commissioners um, for their public resolution approval. Um, so, you know, like I said, in August, 850 <laughs> felt pretty comfortable. <laughs> um, but what this looks like today is um, we should know in the next couple of weeks. This is our top priority. If we weren't here talking to you, we would be working on this program right now. <laughs> so this could be a reality this year. Oh yeah, I'm hoping it's ready to go in April. Oh good. Oh yeah. wow, a month from that. Mm -hmm. So if somebody used the 5% and didn't have the price cap, um, and they want to sell it, that deed restriction stays with the property? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's gonna be a lot of work. For us and that's what we think we we want to um, do two things we want to bring more inventory in to for the for the missing middle right like that's a pretty common housing phrase but we have a lot of affordable tools but there's not a lot to help people from like about 100 percent ami to about 140 percent ami and so the deed restrictions for good deeds are really focused on helping people in that missing middle. If we had more inventory there, people might sell Miller Ranch and step up. There's a whole philosophy around how, how to support people in their housing journey, because it really is a journey, right? Um, and so, so yes, so this, um, the only tricky part of this is that we have set aside $2.5 million of that $10 million for this to be like a revolving fund. So if we need more money, Maybe we'll get it, but just understanding that we're, you know, that's probably two or three deals, maybe less, I don't know, happening simultaneously to help people work through. But I guess we really want to know, is this something that will work? And then if so, how can we make it better? So our philosophy as a team through all these new programs has been, let's do something today and not use the state of Dola as an example and have to take 18 months to roll out a program. So we're gonna have some bumps along the road and that is okay. Our goal is to help people quicker and figure out the bumps as we go. And there's not any restrictions, Patty, so I mean, if we want that kind of done, we'll be in an appropriate Eagle County. Okay. But like, can you, I can do this and buy a place and mentor. Yes. There's no restrictions from like the townships to say, you can't put deep restrictions on properties. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, great question. Um, I wouldn't say there's a blanket answer okay. 
to that. I think it depends on every neighborhood even. Mm -hmm. Like we had our first Eagle Dale deed restriction close just in January. Um, but that was a duplex. So, you know, so just thinking like, could there be HOA restrictions? Yes. Yeah, and we know that there are for some like in Vail, like you can't buy a direct club, you can't, you know, stuff. But that's because right. like, they have a lot of fresh refusal. Yeah, exactly. And so, so, right. so can we work around that? Can we have a, you know, I, I guess that's kind of where I say like, we're going to try to work with everyone <laughs> as best as we can, right? Like, can we keep a deed restriction that still has honors the first right of refusal? Maybe. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at it to where, you know, because we have so many municipalities and different government entities yes. and so forth. And, mm -hmm. As a you know, as a county, like is it just for properties that are governed by Eagle County, or you know, is the town like you know, could I do it in midterm? We That's are it. we are happy to go into any area within Eagle County. Um, and I think what we want you to help us with is doing that due diligence on the front end. So when you're working with your buyer and you're getting your hands on a copy of the HOA documents, making sure that there's not <coughs> something in there. Because we did have somebody ask about a property in Eva and turned out it had a right of first refusal, they went and looked somewhere else. Um, and or is there something within the town that says not in that particular like zoning or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, there's so many layers of regulation. Yeah. And that's why that's why we're gonna we're gonna do our best and we're gonna try to support the local home buyers with this program. But yeah, there may be some places where we have to say you know, for whatever reason. Yeah, and this will work on any property that has a foundation. The properties on underneath on mobile homes rack or anything like that. Yeah. So just to um, go back to the contingencies, the contract's gonna have to have an inspection. Mm -hmm. But if then you said something about appraisal, if it's being by bought cash by you guys, how how do you still meet that appraisal contingency in there? How is that gonna work? These are the things we're trying to work out. Yeah, if you would like to come to our office after this meeting, yeah. we have to pull out the guidelines. We are in we are knee deep in a red line version of these guidelines. And if we, but again, if this appraisal contingency needs to be in there, how are we gonna be able to close it in two weeks? You mentioned that the idea was to close it quick to then be able to sell oh, it. Right. Right. So I think we would really have to we've talked about this because the appraisal gap comes up a lot. Yeah, right. So for some of these good deeds or Mikasa, Valen deeds, how's this appraisal gap going to work? And I think for, especially for that resident occupied deed restriction, we have to really make sure that the conversation you are having with your buyers is you're going to be buying up here and we don't know where it's going after this. And are they, com are they comfortable with this? Are they able to cover it? You know, the question I had the other day was, do the good deeds funds cover the appraisal gap? And they were looking at the resident occupied deed restriction and our response is, you know, this is where your coaching comes in. This is where your expertise and your advising as a real estate agent comes in is, are you comfortable talking to that buyer and saying, um, this home is worth this, right? In this uncertain market that we don't know if it's just gonna continue going up or is it gonna come down at some point? Um, and is the buyer, willing to take that risk that it could go down and are they going to be able to cover that appraisal gap um you know we're we're saying buyer needs to come in with three percent we're willing to cover good deeds i would say good deeds is not like here to cover that appraisal gap specifically but we are bringing money to the closing table and i, I think it becomes a sort of gray area where we're not saying no if there is an appraisal gap that's kind of the reality of our situation today yeah. so it's a good question and then the assignability. So every contract is going to have to be assignable to the housing, the housing authority. authority. Mm -hmm. and then, and housing and development. It would be really useful if you guys could come up with a clause that we could add that is yes. accurate as mm -hmm. to what we're writing a contract with so that we all have a standard clause that yeah. says it's going to, this is how it needs to read. Yes. That's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what are the criteria? Three yeah. percent? So it's going to be the same as the either one of the good deeds. Oh, so that makes sense. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's going to be the same as the good deeds program where you're going to be, you know, live and work in Eagle County. Yeah. Um, three percent is your minimum contribution at closing from the buyer. It is combinable with down payment assistance. Just remember you've got to be careful who your lender is when you're doing the, com the combining. Um, primary residence only. So in this 
deed restriction program, you cannot own any other real estate anywhere, not even in Panama. Um, or Denver. <laughs> Panama sounds better. <laughs> There. Yeah, more. <laughs> um, and then you have the selection of either the resident occupied or price cap fee restrictions. So this is when we do the cash buy, we are going to try to secure that home for the future. So, so it could be five percent cash for a non, but it'll still be deed restricted. Right? Yes. I I see we're not doing a great job of managing our time and. Um, I also see that Monique had a question on chat. Monique, are you on the line? Can you tell us what your question was in regards to? Because I lost track of what we were talking about at that time. You said, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was just when you were when you were talking about how you were going to qualify people, how well, you know, if you've only been here for a few months versus someone who's been here much longer, well, I when when we start being so subjective in a personal pick does that not open you or us up for a fair housing violation because sure. we're you know i'm encouraged not to even submit love letters anymore because that's a violation so or can be construed as a violation so i just you know how do you advise a, someone coming into town who is working for the for the county and now he can't get or she can't get a home because they've only been there a month is kind of where I was going at. Great question. So what we're just trying to do is to find an eligible household per our guidelines. And then within the deed restrictions, they allow anybody to apply, but certain folks will just have preference. And I think if that's, is that where the, what we were talking about when that question came up? I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's, it's having that subjective preference. How does that open us up for any kind of legality? Well, and I would be, I, I will speak to this too, that in fair housing, we are talking about protected classes, either federally or state mandated protected classes. And our housing guidelines do not <clears throat> call out any protected class. So when okay. we talk about do you work in Eagle County that is not a race or a creed or sexual gender or identity or anything like that? So, good question. Does that give you the answer you? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, do you want me to do this one? We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll okay. go quickly through this because we have more to cover and we're running out of time. <laughs> so, we, we yeah. at the Valley Home Store really like focus a lot on home buyers and sellers, right? That's what we do, that's the core of our business. But we also recognize that with these old housing moves, we really needed to provide some support for renters. And so this is our big program that is available now, the Rental Assistance Program. And basically we are offering assistance to locally employed people with their first and last month's rent. So coming up with, I don't know when the last time you had to rent a place, but a lot of them are like $3,000 now. And so that can be about $9,000 you have to come in to move into a place. And this program has funds available um, to provide first and last month's rent directly to the landlord, that uh, the security deposit is the responsibility of the tenant, that the, um, the applicant must sign a one-year lease and it has to be a new lease. And there's an application for this process that goes along with it. They must work in Eagle County at least 30 hours per week on average year round. And um, we've already helped about a dozen people with this program, it's been awesome. The key part of this is that you do have to pay back the last month's rent over 11 months. And so we set up a payment plan and you send a check every month and it re replenishes the fund. Um, and then also if you make above 120% AMI, you repay back both months over an 11 month period. So that's considered more of a loan. So this program, um, we launched it and we had people taking advantage of it right away. So get the word out. Um, Jesus is our main contact here and that's his contact information at the bottom. How long has this been in, in place? Since October 19th. Wow. I told you we're moving fast. <laughs> we're not messing around. Um, that's this, awesome. Thank you. It's too bad. I, I don't know that. about that program. That's great. That's the next thing that I'm really proud of, and I have to like, I have such an amazing team. I'm so proud. 
Um, we were able to apply for emergency solutions grant, which is also known as the CARES Act funding. And I don't know if you guys have ever really studied if you were to be homeless in this county, what services are, are available to you, but there are not a lot. Um, and so in writing this grant, um, we asked for some funds and we were awarded $637,000, $650,000. And um, we're able to hire uh, Monica, who just started with us a couple weeks ago. And her job in the next six months is to spend that money as quickly as possible. Um, think about all of Eagle County, right? That's the Eagle River Valley and the Roaring Fork Valley. In the Roaring Fork Valley, they actually have a homeless shelter and a day center there. Um, they have safe outdoor spaces for parking. They have a lot of services that we don't have here. And um, so this grant will support street outreach, temporary emergency shelter, and rapid rehousing programs. And our partners are Catholic Charities, Recovery Resources, which is in the Roaring Fork Valley, and Mira, which is the Eagle Valley Charitable Foundation. So really excited about this new program that actually got formally launched yesterday. The board signed the contracts. We're going to start spending the money. And, and just really for, your, for you guys, like, um, there are dozens of nonprofits that do this work in our community. It's just hidden, right? And so this is a chance for us to take it out of the shadows, to formalize a referral system, and to bring the coordination and the work together. And so I'm so excited about this. Like, this is something I'm super passionate about. Because I think people say, there's no homeless people in Bill. I'm like, yes, yes, there are. You just don't see them, and you just don't know. And, and what it looks like is very different here than what it looks like in Washington, D.C., right? Or in Santa Monica or wherever. So really excited about this program. Um, I'm gonna keep moving. The next program is also coming soon. We're writing the guidelines for this program. Yeah, this is ADU. So accessory dwelling units. Um, this is a program to support current homeowners. So we caught the renters, we'll be caught. Hopefully we will catch the homeless response, the renters, the homeowners and home buyers. These are actually people who own homes who legally can add an ADU, a lockout, a mother-in-law, whatever <coughs> word it is that you want to call it. Um, we are putting together a loan program to support the improvements on your property. Um, we are going to ask that that ADU gets rented, um, that does not go to short-term rental, like it's rented to someone on a year-round um, lease, a local employee in Eagle County. And so this is a really neat opportunity for you to communicate this to your clients and say, well, forget about Betsy and I, we're in Eagle Vale, I don't, we can't legally do this, but in neighborhoods where you can legally do this, we will have funds available um, for this program. And Megan is our contact on this program. That was gonna be my question, because in Homestead, you can't have an ADU either. So is there a way, is, is the housing department talking to all those different HOA is not like today. that. To try to <laughs> but yes, it's on our change list. that around. So once Eventually. the program is up and running, we know um, Eagle Ranch is a great example. They can, and there are people who've already reached out to us to say, "We want this money. We want to do this." So I know there's going to be like a phase one of people who can already do it, and then phase two is us having those conversations with Homestead or Eagleville and saying, "Hey." Can we make these legal? Can we change the PUDs? It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a heavy lift to do that. But I think the benefit is that it's an existing house. It's already there. Someone can exactly. move in tomorrow. You just need to make it legal yeah. that they can do right. it. And I think having the conversations with the homeowners you know, with the HOA boards that you're already sitting on, I think that this is where you as the community can go back and say, this is what we want. We want to change for this. We're evolving now. Because it's a benefit for everyone. It is. So do you have a map of the areas that don't allow it right now? <laughs> we, um, it's complicated because even in, um, you know, like let's just use, keep using Eagle. You have Eagle Ranch, a separate area, a separate PUD. And then you may have a condominium association say that they can't do it there, but they can do it there. So we looked into hiring someone to formalize that information for us, but it's an expensive study. I think I probably would have had to spend about $75,000 to get someone to look at all the PUDs and all the regulations to tell us. So it's going to be up to the owner to do their own research and come to us and say, I can do this, <laughs> at least in phase one. Phase two, we might be, again, our, our goal is to do what we can today with what we have. So 
I have one more slide, so I'm going to cruise over to that. Sorry, Patty. Do you want to jump in on this one or you want me to keep going? You can do this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this next program that we proposed is a long term rental incentive program for landlords who are renting right now, maybe in the short term rental market, to come back into the long term rental pool. Oh, awesome. So this is the last on our list because I have the least like formalized guidelines around this. If you've been paying attention, Summit County has a formal program where they are actually writing a check to people to put it back. Yep. Um, ours may look like that. Ours may be different. Ours may be, we may end up having a, 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 you know, a list of renters that we pull background checks on that we can provide property managers. I don't know what it's gonna take to incentivize private landlords to pull their units back in. But um, this program, we're just starting to research it now. So if you guys have a chance to talk to your clients and ask them if you know of somebody and you can provide that information to us, that would be super helpful because um, we know that this can be, uh, this can make a big difference in our community. We've lost a lot of units to short-term rental. How can we get some of those back? And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about 30 units is our goal for this year, to get 30 units back into the long-term um, rental inventory. And Monica and Dan are leading that program for us. So finally, this is everybody on our team. If you need to contact us, um, please, please use our emails, our phones, whatever. My phone keeps Can, can you guys share all these slides uh, with us? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that would be great. Mel has this one, actually. Yeah, Mel would be great if she could send it out. This is really good information. So I'm sorry we went over, but obviously we no, uh, no. had a lot of good interaction. I really appreciate you guys being like the affordable housing ambassadors. And consider Patty and I your resource. If you have any questions, please call us anytime. Um, and we're, we are going to stick around for George's presentation. But how about we do a quick five minute break? Can we all pull that off? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the Board of Realtors for including us in your conversation and in your meeting here today. Um, again, I can't see everybody on the screen, but I suspect um, if it's the same uh, likely folks, I've met a number of you over the years. And uh, like I said, thanks for, thanks for including us in your, in your conversation. What I wanted to do today was just share with you our Avail Indeed program, uh, primarily kind of walk through uh, some of the processes there. I suspect I didn't get to join in on Kim, Patty, and Eric's conversations earlier today, but I suspect they've covered much of this, um, of kind of the ins and outs of the, of the program, but um, I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the Avail Indeed program. Uh, you know, kind of run you through it at a higher level of what that program is, talk about some of the, the application process and procedures, and um, maybe share with you a few of the lessons that we've learned along the way, and uh, some of the, the new work that we're looking at going here into the, uh, into the future. So with that, if I can share, I'm going to share my screen here, if that's possible. You know, I'm guessing you can all see that screen. Is that a yes? Yes, we can. There we go. Um, like I said, Vale indeed, you know, it was it was back in I want to say 2017, 2016 timeframe when the Bail Town Council, I, I think after decades of discussing and talking about um, about our housing issues and challenges within the town of Vail specifically and making some headway you know along the way really got to a point where where they acknowledged they were they were kind of tired of talking about this issue and they actually wanted to start doing something around housing in the town of Vail. So in 2017 kind of in line with our commitment to deliver on housing in the Vail community the, the Vail Town Council, in collaboration with the Vail Local Housing Authority, we adopted our Vail Housing 2027 Strategic Plan. And, and I think what's, what's significant about this document was, you know, kind of for the first time in Vail's history, history, we changed the conversation around workforce housing or employee housing or affordable housing 
and we really started talking about what it was we wanted to to achieve or realize in the town of Vail. And for us, it was this notion of creating and supporting community through the creation of resident occupied housing within the town of Vail. And by definition for us, resident occupied housing was going to include or does include that workforce and employee housing component, but it also kind of took it to that next level or that next objective, which was ensuring that we had a a year round community living within the town of Vail. I think many of you, you know, may be aware, um, you know, we, we talk often about our vision being to be the premier international mountain resort community. And when we talk about, you know, resort community, we are talking about resort and community. I had the good fortune um, over my, in, in a previous uh, career working with the town's community development department, to help lead the town through two and a half billion dollars of redevelopment that really focused on the resort side of resort community. And this Vail Housing 2027 plan was to begin shifting the focus to the community side of resort community. The plan in itself was really pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go into to a lot of detail other than to just talk about we, we focus specifically on a goal, means, and a method. And in this case, for us, the goal was about acquiring 1,000 additional uh, deed restrictions within the town of Vail by the year 2027. When we set about um, this journey, we had about 700, 688 deed restricted properties in the town of Vail. So if we are to realize our goal in, in by 2027, the town of Vail will have uh, just shy of 1,700 deed restricted properties within uh, within the Vail community. Um, you know, it kind of in keeping with the town council's commitment to deliver on housing. In uh, since the adoption of this plan and really our implementation beginning in 2018, we have since increased the supply of deed restricted homes available to Vail residents by 48 percent. If we continue on the pace that we're that we are on. Um, we will likely achieve our goal sooner than 2027. Although um, I'm often quick to point out, you know, maybe we've picked away at some of the, the lowest hanging fruit out there, but um, I continue to be optimistic that the town will see uh, its goal achieved by 2027 with 1,000 additional deed restricted properties. This was, was really the, the issue that we identified. This was our problem. Um, and, it, and it was a complex problem. And we chose to take the, the deed restriction purchase process as our simple solution to addressing this issue. I'm just gonna take a quick moment to run through this slide. I think many folks may have seen this um, in the past, but really it speaks to in the town of Vail, we have 5,300 people living year round in the, in the town of Vail. Those 5,300 people live in one of the 7,200 or now 7,300 uh, residential dwelling units within the town of Vail. But the reality is they don't live in all of those 7,300 homes. Instead, they live in one of the 1,750 occupied homes or at the time, one of the 688 deed restricted homes. That meant that remaining 4,800 unoccupied homes those are our part-time residents and vacation property owners. And what we were finding was about nine times out of 10, uh, when a property, uh, a local who was living in one of the 1,750 homes, when a local sold their home, they didn't nine times out of 10, they didn't sell it to another local, but instead more often than not, it sold to that pool within the 4,800 unoccupied homes. And once the home made it into that pool, rarely if ever did it make it back out into the occupied or deed restricted pool of homes. So this was our issue. And, and I think many of you are aware, you know, the town of Vail, we're surrounded on all four sides by US Forest Service property. Uh, much of that, that property boundary is wilderness area uh, adjacency and our ability to address our housing problem, you know, to, to kind of build our way out of this problem was not going to be successful for us. So we needed to come up with a way to protect and preserve some of the existing dwelling units that we already had in the town of Vail. And that's how we came up with the Vail Indeed program. And it was really 
uh, pretty straightforward and simple in its approach. And that was, we were simply going to buy deed restrictions on existing uh, dwelling units within the community. We've since expanded kind of the, the parameters or boundaries of that. And we'll actually buy deed restrictions in partnership with new development uh, within the town of Vail and in partnership uh, down Valley in some of our, our neighboring communities down Valley. But the other, I think the other thing that we did was unique with our Vail and deed program, unlike some of the other deed restricted properties uh, here in Vail is that um, this is really about resident occupancy. We, we don't care or, or we're indifferent about who owns the property. We're more concerned about who is residing in the property. So unlike some of our other deed restrictions, which require owner occupancy or limit it to rental uh, occupancy, the Vail and Deed program is, is, is the least restrictive of all of our deed restriction types, uh, thereby kind of having the least amount of financial impact or uh, on the on the value of that property once that deed restriction is in place. Um, you know, at the time when we were going through this process, I often shared with the town council and I've shared with other communities who have, uh, you know, since uh, adopted programs similar to this when they asked me questions about, well, could we, you know, could we restrict this or could we add this restriction or that restriction? And my response is always the same. You can add as many restrictions to the deed as you wish or as you're willing to pay for because each one of those restrictions is going to have a negative impact on the value of that property because of its of its limitations that it puts. So our Vail and Deed program really is our least restrictive uh, deed restriction that we have in the town of Vail and again limits the, the program really to uh, resident occupancy only. For those of you who may have already had a chance, um, you know, we, we provide much of this information uh, around the Vail and Deed program. Uh, there's a list of frequently asked questions about the program as well as application materials, uh, an outline of the process uh, that one can go through if they're interested in participating in the program. Uh, you can find that online at vailindeed.com. Uh, we do keep that website um, up to date, so it is kind of the most current information that we have uh, available to us for the for the program. What I what I like to share about this program, I think you know, since its adoption, um, we there's no less than 15 other communities within the the country now that have a similar deed restriction type of program. Uh, kind of uh, mirrored after some of the, the notions and ideas that were put forth by the Vail and Deed program. And it's not just, you know, uh, here in the Rocky Mountain West. We are uh, working with some communities uh, now in North Carolina, Vermont, uh, in the Adirondacks of New York, that uh, even the upper peninsula or upper lower uh, peninsula of Michigan. Uh, in a resort community has adopted a similar deed restriction program and then tailored that program kind of to suit their, their local needs. But at the end of the day, the program is really about acquiring deed restrictions on property for uh, occupancy of those homes by, in our case, residents in the town of Vail. And it, what I'd like to share is, you know, I'm, we're often asked about, you know, the numbers and, and how, does, how does the program work and where do the numbers lie? Uh, these numbers that I'm sharing here on the screen are numbers that are accurate through end of December uh, 2021. So we've done 79 transactions total. As a result of those transactions, we now have 165 uh, new deed restricted properties within the town of Vail. That equates to about 136,000 square feet of, of GRFA uh, in the community. And I think many of you are familiar with our gross residential floor area and and maybe the value that has um, in understanding uh, the, the restriction and, and how it impacts GRFA. But also, you know, our deed restriction investment at about $11.5 million or an average cost of $83 per square foot or now just shy of $70,000 per deed restriction. But I like to share, I think, about this program. And while this isn't, um, you know, the only uh, initiative that the Town of Vale is pursuing, it is probably one of the most cost effective programs that we have in place. If for, for those of you who've, you know, been in the Valley for a while and are aware of the town's participation in the Timber Ridge Village Apartments back in the day, 
when we bought that 10 acre piece of property for just shy of $20 million, you know, we were providing housing for 288 bail residents for, like I said, just shy of uh, $20 million. With the Vail Indeed program, and we did it all in one location. With the Vail Indeed program, we disperse uh, these homes across the entire Vail community, and we've done it for about $11.5 million, and we've actually provided housing for an estimated 375 year-round and seasonal uh, Vail residents. So I like to, to think this is, uh, again, not the only approach, but it, it, it does lend itself as one of the more cost-effective approaches for uh, acquiring deed restrictions to achieve that objective of ensuring housing for our, again, our year-round and seasonal residents. Some other actions that, that uh, the town, in, and I apologize, I'll go through these really quickly in case um, Eric and or Patty and Kim already ran through some of these, but some, some of these are specific to the, to the town of Vail. Others are uh, in partnership and collaboration with, um, like I said, some of our, our Down Valley partners, as well as some other agencies uh, uh, such as CDOT uh, here in the, in the Vail Valley. The residences at Mainville, that's a project that you, you've seen, that's under construction right now, scheduled for completion early summer of 2023, right near the, uh, in just east of the existing Middle Creek Village apartments at the Mainville roundabout. Those are all rental apartments, um, as is an opportunity the town is currently uh, discussing and pursuing in, co in collaboration with uh, the town of Avon for acquiring <coughs> excuse me, in interest in the kayak crossing apartments there in, uh, in Dow Junction. A new opportunity, a new for sale opportunity that we're pursuing with the Colorado Department of Transportation is in Eastvale on about a 1.7 acre parcel of ground where we're looking to put something similar to what we built um, on the Chamonix site, uh, a series of townhomes that would be a for sale product. Uh, intentionally kind of focusing on that missing middle within our community that um, when it comes time to move up or upgrade or move around within the community, more often than not, this for sale product doesn't exist within a price point that is attainable for, for our kind of middle income folks in the community. And they are then choosing to kind of pull up stakes and, and move down valley. That's, an, again, an important segment of our community in a segment that we want to keep uh, and have opportunities for housing. So that is a project, again, out in Eastvale, intersections of Columbine Drive and Spruce Way, if you're familiar with that area of Eastvale, right near the, the tunnel uh, going underneath, the, uh, underneath I-70. I think another opportunity that um, I'm certain Kim and others brought this one up is I think a bigger opportunity within uh, the county in the region itself, and that would be an opportunity on the state land board parcel there in Eagle Vale. Uh, we have been um, communicating with uh, the state land board and helping them prepare some documents that they're sharing with others on what some of the, the development potential could be of that, that property long term. I While nothing has been decided or is even uh, in the works uh, specifically at, at this time on that site, I would foresee that, you know, it's going to be a wide range and a mix of products, much like what the, the county was uh, already uh, produced down at, uh, at Miller Ranch in, um, in Edwards. The Timber Ridge Village Apartments, uh, you know, Timber Ridge, it, it's not getting any newer. In fact, it's getting older by the day. It does need to be redeveloped. We acknowledge that. Uh, you know, we've already redeveloped half of that property in, in partnership with Gorman and Company uh, a number of years ago when they built um, a, a series of one in two bedroom, four rent apartments on that site. We again are looking at uh, taking down the Timber Ridge Village Apartments. Likely, we wouldn't, we wouldn't start this project until after the residences at Mainvale are completed uh, so that we do have some place to uh, move some of our displaced residences that would or uh, residents that live in timber ridge could move over to the the residences at mainville but um you know the, the vale town council and the vale local housing authority are looking at getting uh 
bullishly aggressive, I think, on the development of this parcel and, you know, the conversation around density done right and getting a minimum of 200 plus rental apartments on that site with the potential for some four sale units up in along and adjacent to Lions Ridge Loop, the north side of that property. Again, if you're familiar with um, with how the, the, the Timber Ridge uh, apartments lay out. Another one that's not on here, but you know, one that um, we're starting to, to chase down and, and get some feedback on is um, the 3.9 acre US Postal Service property uh, immediately to the west of Timber Ridge. Uh, we, you know, we, we are, are in conversations with folks who have um, some experience working with the federal government on the disposition of federal uh, property. And I'm not sure if, if many folks are aware of this, this is something new to me, but um, in this day and age, the US Post Office owns less and less of their properties, and they actually now lease more and more of their properties, almost to a, a, a three to one uh, uh, ratio at, at this point in time. But the post office in Vail is one of those properties still owned by the federal government. And um, they too have some needs, I think, in looking at that building. There are opportunities in, in uh, the efficiencies of that building itself. And there might be some opportunity to, to collaborate on a redevelopment of that 3.9 acre site as well. So more, more opportunities coming. We talked about the Vail and Deed, uh, Deed Restriction Purchase Program. When I jumped into the call, I, I noticed that uh, Kim was talking about the local home buyers assistance program. The town of Vail, I think we're experiencing the same thing that, that everyone else is uh, experiencing in the county. And that is most of many of our Vail indeed uh, applicants are losing opportunities to buy homes, not because they're not qualified or not because they're not interested, but because they're being outbid in many cases, being outbid by cash buyers uh, in the market. And the town of Vale has decided that, you know, we'll, if, if we can, we will step in where possible and, and likely, and we'll be the rich aunt or the rich uncle and help with this home buying uh, opportunity for, for uh, folks here in the community which would again likely result in another deed restricted property for the town. A, a buy down program, you know, something the town kind of walked away from in, in, in these last couple of years, but kind of coming back to, to the light again, the town, um, and I think I'm talking to the right group when I say um, the town of Vail has, you know, given us a, a, a sum of money, a pot of money to go out and start buying properties. So if you folks know of anybody who has a, has a listing that's about to come on the market or something that might be appealing that you think to a local, give me a call and um, let's talk about potentially the town of Ale stepping in and purchasing that property and and we'll figure out what we'll what we're going to do with it. Whether we deed restrict that property and then put it back on the market or if we hold on to that property for um, our internal uh, workforce is still not yet decided. It really depends upon the property and the opportunity. But in this case, you know, the town of Vail, we are the fourth largest uh, employer within the community, and we too have a housing need. So we have to uh, figure out a way to uh, start providing some housing opportunities for our employees. Since in many of our exit interviews with our departing employees, almost almost everyone speaks to the lack of availability and affordability and attainability of housing as one of their reasons that they are leaving employment with the town of Ale and in, in many cases leaving employment altogether within the the county and in the region the Vail housing 2027 strategic plan that was a document that is really predicated on a lot of the forces that are out there in the market today and that now is a is a three to four year old document it is a document that be, because of changes in in the market we acknowledge we need to to update that so here in 2022 we will be working on an update to that plan um, i think you're going to see um, a, a, again programs like like veil indeed continue to go forward but this um, local home buyers assistance program uh, taking a greater 
uh, role uh, along with buy downs, as well as a wider uh, view in starting to look west of Dow Junction for some housing opportunities. What we're hopeful for is that those housing opportunities will come in collaboration with you know, the private sector and other public sector partners uh, you know, west of, of Dow Junction. Um, Eric probably brought this up. Eric Heil may have brought this up, but this notion of, of looking around the, as a whole, looking around the region or some in, in inventorying our housing sites uh, where some future land uh, development opportunities might be and pursuing some land banking opportunities. I think with an updated strategic plan for uh, the Vail Housing 2027 plan, you'll see that land banking is uh, again, going to take a higher priority uh, for the town of Vail. No longer, I think, is the town of Vail just focusing on kind of the here and now, but um, this notion of um, imagine, if you will, if you know you could leave your successor's successor with an opportunity to build, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Uh, you know, where where would we all be if we had those land opportunities from 20 years ago to work with today? Lastly, and I'll wrap this up, um, you know, we are continuing to explore some uh, short term rental regulations. Um, if you've been following along and working in watching some of the Vail Town Council meetings, you'll see that this coming Tuesday on March uh, 15th, we'll present the third part of our short term rental uh, impact study within the town of Vail. And unlike some other places, uh, we're not finding that short-term rental has as significant an impact as some folks, I think, wanted to believe or, or just generally believe exists. By and large, 70% of the short-term rentals in the registered uh, short-term rentals in the town of Vail exists within those areas of, of Lion's Head and Vail Village, um, kind of what we're calling Zone 1. The remainder uh, of that 30% are in Zone 2, but then again, the preponderance of those properties are actually selling and trading for north of, of you know, a million three, a million four. And as we've demonstrated through our Vail and Deed program, that's not the type of homes that our locals are looking uh, to purchase and acquire. So um, it does have an impact. I think you will see some policy uh, updates, um, specifically as it relates to some additional housing opportunities but maybe not nearly as significant or uh, severe as you may have seen in some other uh, resort regions and communities across the West here, here recently. So with that, those are all my remarks and I'm happy to take any and all the questions you guys wanna share. George, I have a quick question. Um, it has to do with the um, I wrote it down here. Sorry. So can somebody buy land and then uh, start with that? I kind of woke up on me there at the end. I wish can somebody buy land. And now it looks like you guys might all be muted. <laughs> now go ahead and ask that again if you don't mind. I, well, I have two questions. Like, sure. So uh, the question is, can somebody start with buying land and use that, get that deed description, then you know, work out the housing portion on top of it? And number two, where is the Eagle Vale State Land uh, parcel? Um, can somebody, I'll, we'll start with the first one. Can somebody buy land? Yes. In, in fact, we're in a conversation right now um, uh, with a um, with a land developer, I'll just leave it at that. With a land developer who is actually looking at acquiring land, and their um, their motivation or their interest today would be 
uh, potentially be a valent deed purchase just on the land to place a deed restriction on the land so that in the future we're guaranteed that that land will be developed as deed restricted housing but that land uh, the financial uh, sale for the for the deed restriction can help make that land purchase possible today so yeah land, land is is definitely something that we would look at through um, through Vail Indeed, as well as other partnerships. If you think back to, um, you know, one of the first uh, deed restriction purchases that, that we made in a, in a large lump sum was in partnership with Sawn and Out Properties when they rebuilt the Solar Vail uh, apartments. And, and that kind of follows along that, that same line of, of thinking or concept in, in buying deed restriction. I don't know if um, if there's you know the state land board parcel um, Eagle Vale Highways six and twenty four where the CDOT maintenance facility is on kind of the far eastern end of um, of the Eagle Vale area. Thank you. You bet. Is there any way Town of Vail is looking at property, say in Moon Turn, or at the end of the railroad, railroad turntable area, or anything like that as an exchange? Or you know, I I, I think um, it, it has has been you know demonstrated by some of the conversations that we've had. The, the instructions that, that have been shared with us in the housing department is we'll kind of look at any in all opportunities and, you know, see what, what, what we can run to ground and see if there is a potential there. So, um, um, you know, we, we get some crazy ideas, but then we also get some ideas that turn into the things like that CDOT parcel out in, um, out in Eastvale. So, um, yeah, and, and I think if Kim and, and Patty are still in the room, I think they would share something similar that uh, we're all looking for these, these opportunities. And I suspect that as time goes on here, you'll see greater partnership amongst, you know, the county and the town of Avon and Mintern and all of the municipalities in beginning to look more collaboratively and regionally at some of these housing solutions, regardless of of the municipal, you know, jurisdiction. In fact, I think one of the first ones that we did um, in collaboration with Eagle County was the deed restriction purchases down at um, at Six West. So, you know, I, I think the the town and the county realized that, you know, in partnership we could we could get to a place where instead of what was it 75 or 80 percent of the homes were deed restricted we could get to a place where 100 percent of those homes were, were deed restricted if we worked together and lo and behold we did and that's what we got george i'm on your website in the indeed website and i don't see where you can find the restrictions the qualifications what people need what you provide is there something am I missing something? The, the, the on there, there the I don't have it opened here in front of me the four uh, at the application the purchase and sale contract the subordination agreement and then the deed restriction itself should all be the four documents that are listed um, on, on that web page and those are really the four documents not every one of those documents is needed. For example, uh, the subordination agreement. We don't always rely upon the subordination agreement depending upon the circumstances. But in those instances where we do, we do ask that the lender subordinates their financing to or their deed of trust to our deed restriction uh, just to protect and preserve our interest. The um, application uh, should also be on there Pretty straightforward application. Martha Anderson in our office um, has come on board uh, right around the first of the year here, and um, Martha is helping us process those applications for review by our local housing authority. Um, hi, George. Joanna Kerwin. Of the deed restricted homes, how many people in Vail actually live in Vail and work in Vail, or do they live in Vail and work down Valley? 
We have we have a, a mix. I want to say the last time we we pulled that data out, we were seeing about 65% of the folks residing in a deed restricted property had at least one person working within the town of Vail. We do see some, you know, down valley kind of out migration of, of some of those jobs. The the town council, we may see this, you know, on projects like um, the residences at Mainvale, as well as Timber Ridge, uh, kind of a similar approach that we put in place down at um, at Six West, which was kind of this waterfall of preference, so that um, we're, we're not going to limit anybody, but some folks are going to be able to skip the line, so to speak, to have an opportunity depending upon their their place of employment. I think that's great. Thank you. The, the, the trick there in, in, again, working with Eagle County uh, at Six West, the trick there was just making sure that, you know, we have that partnership um, that we have at Six West to help enforce the terms of the deed restriction, because many of our deed restriction terms tie back to zoning, and our zoning regulations obviously don't apply outside our jurisdiction, so we have to kind of take a different enforcement uh, approach to it, but I think we get to the we get to the same place. And as long as we can do that, and as long as we can continue to demonstrate value to the tail to the bail taxpayer, I think we will see support for um, you know doing these things like creating that waterfall of preference, and as well as looking outside the four walls of the of the town of Vail. Thank you. Perfect. Um, I just want to mention one more thing that the Housing Authority is really focusing on, which is kind of also near and dear to my heart, not just our homeless response, but also building in some more diversity, equity, and inclusion in the services we provide. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's everyone here in the room looks like they're basically non people of color. Um, and I want to acknowledge that, you know, while we do great things, it's been a really um, important piece for, for me and for my team to really think about how we can provide more equity in our community, how we can, we can serve more communities of color. And so our mission, our business, we're going to spend the next little bit really diving into what can we be doing that we're not doing to serve the, the parts of our community that maybe don't show up for a home buyer class or don't know how to work with a realtor because they just haven't gotten to the step of the first step of having the bank account, right? And so, um, Chris, you and I have talked about this dozens of times, but how do we encourage people to start to build credit um, so that they can get a loan? And so I want to at least acknowledge with this group that that is happening in our community. And um, it's not an easy problem to solve, but that's something that um, Jesus on our team is going to be starting to go out with the mirror bus. He's there with them next week. And he's starting to have conversations to say, what are your housing needs? What does it look like? How can we help you? And so we're going to get a lot of, we're going to collect a lot of information over the next six months and really kind of figure out um, what maybe we're not doing today or we're not even aware that we could be doing to help um, create better equity across all of our community here in Hill County. So 